Arif Virani was our guest last season. He was the candidate in the riding of Parkdale High Park. He won the NDP stronghold against uh, Peggy Nash, the former NDP finance critic. First of all, congratulations on that win. Thank you very much. How does it feel? It feels terrific. I mean, it's very satisfying. It's uh, rewarding. It's exhilarating. It's a uh, it's a little bit uh, surreal, uh, even even though it's about eight days old now. It's a uh, it's a number of things. It's a lot of emotions sort of going going through my head, and sort of the family's excited. My extended family's very excited, and people in the riding are excited as well. Seventy eight days, one longest campaigns on record, and we met even before that. You had the nomination prior to that, and you were campaigning. What did it feel like through that marathon campaign? It was a bit exhausting, <laughs> to, be, to be candid. Uh, I remember around Labor Day thinking, wow, another six weeks of this. This has already taken a bit of a toll. Uh, at times, it felt like it was never ending. Mm -hmm. uh, it took a toll of sort of, you know, there's an element of physical fatigue. My feet hurt a lot at the end of the day. How many uh, shoes did you go through? I went through a, a, about a couple of pairs, but I tried to constantly replace my New Balance running shoes. And I'm not <laughs> trying to plug New Balance, but they were phenomenal shoes. Uh, and I kept going back to them. I tried fancy dress shoes. I tried fancy mm. walking shoes. But at the end of the day, these sort of marathon type running shoes were my go to. And mm -hmm. they were terrific for me. Uh, and it was, you know, there was this definitely a physical toll. And uh, as well as sort of being needing to be mentally engaged from 9 a.m. till 9 p.m. every single night. You know, you wanted downtime. I struggled with not being able to catch up with enough of the Blue Jays games, watching <laughs> the 30-minute versions instead of the full versions. So there were some challenges, obviously, but uh, it was, uh, it proved to be, the long campaign, I think, proved to be helpful, both locally and, I think, nationally. Mm -hmm. And I, I say that insofar as, again, taking on a well-known uh, challenger, a well-known incumbent as a, as a first-time challenger. People got, you know, 70 days to get to know me, uh, whether that, w that was at events or at the doors. And I think people also had 78 days to get to know Justin Trudeau. I, I knew him from the past, as I mentioned to you in our right. last interview. I knew what he was capable of. I knew him as a person who was very conversant on the issues and had great uh, leadership skills and great judgment. But I think Canadians needed to see, see that for themselves. And I think s over 78 days, they clearly did, particularly in the last three weeks of the campaign. Now, somebody told me that you knocked on virtually every door in your riding, something well over 80% of the doors. I think that's right. I mean, it was it was necessary. I think again, as somebody who is a as is a challenger, I think uh, you, that's what you need to do. I again benefited from having been nominated last November, so mm -hmm. I started knocking on doors in late January. But I think people appreciated that because th by the end they started to say, "Well, I met you two or three times mm -hmm. now, and you know, at the subway stop or at the farmers market, you came to my door." So I think they at least appreciated that sort of tenacity. So, Prime Minister Elect uh, Trudeau was the next day at subway stations in his riding and uh, meeting people without a huge entourage and just saying thank you, similar to what you're saying that you did in, in your riding. And I think that's a testament to, to the man himself. I mean, it's, it's, it's quite incredible. I, again, I was getting fatigued traveling an eight square kilometer riding called Parkdale High Park. Mm -hmm. This man was traveling coast to coast to coast around the country, being apart from Sophie and his three kids. And the very next day, he's at a subway station in downtown Montreal. Mm -hmm. like that's, it's just tremendous in terms of his commitment, his level of engagement. And we take our cues from that, right? Mm -hmm. I, I always try and take good cues from people at any pl elected level in terms of what has worked for them and what is a successful sort of recipe. And, you know, people had told me, be out there regularly. And when I saw Justin mm -hmm. Trudeau the next day doing it, I thought, well, you know, I know what I'm doing this Saturday. And, you know, taking my kids in tow is a way of sort of getting them actively involved because, you know, they certainly miss their dad. So, Understandably. Now, the riding itself has uh, been held by Peggy Nash, uh, who is considered, like I said, at the top, a heavyweight in the NDP. She's former party president. She held the finance critic role. And she was been successful over the years. Now, taking her on, you know, a lot of people were not sure if this was uh, the best uh, riding to choose from. Yeah. And I think that's interesting because a on, a couple of, on a couple of fronts. One is that, first of all, I have a ton of respect for Peggy Nash. I have a ton of respect for anyone who's committed to serve and to serve successfully. She dedicated six of the last nine years serving as the member of parliament mm -hmm. for, for that riding. But I also appreciate that, you know, the riding had been won twice and lost twice by Ms. Nash, right? Right. So t it went liberal NDP, liberal NDP in each of the last four elections. So mm -hmm. 04, 06, 08, and 2011. So that metronome has proven consistent once again. It's flipped once again. I hope to ensure that, you know, that's more of a, a, long, a, long, a longevity to the current run. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of sort of taking on Ms. Nash, sure, it was definitely daunting. It was, there's no doubt it was daunting. But I tr tend to see things as the glass is half full. I looked at the historic track record. I know about what I'm capable of as, you know, in terms of my litigation practice for the last 14 years in terms of my own sort of work ethic. And I knew how people were responding to me. And they responded at that nomination. We had 1,630 people vote at a nomination meeting in a downtown Toronto riding, which was almost unheard Huge. of in Liberal Party circles. So you could sense that there was both an interest in politics, but also an interest in the Liberal Party's fortunes in Parkdale High Park. And I used that as good momentum and carried that forward into the, into the election campaign. And was it daunting? Sure. Or were there times when I thought it wouldn't go so well? Definitely. I mean, that's the ebb and flow of any campaign. Mm -hmm. But I remained optimistic in terms of also sort of my uh, social justice orientation, what I brought to the table. So when people learned about, you know, me being a refugee, when they learned about me being a war crimes prosecutor, when they learned about constitutional law and human rights law as a background, when they learned about me being a father of a young family, being an active community volunteer, that all had good traction at the door. So unless people were bold-faced lying to me, which as it turns out they weren't, um, <laughs> there was a, a sense of, you know, there is uh, some traction and some resonance for both what I'm bringing to the table and also what the party is bringing to the table in terms of policies. And as more of those got revealed, it became more and more of a sort of a, a steady momentum that was building. So let's talk about the issues that uh, you faced at the door in your riding. What were people talking to you during the election about? So they talked to me a lot about the environment. They talked to me a lot about infrastructure. I mean, Park Daily Park is Bloor West, it's Roncesvalles, it's mm -hmm. High Park, it's the Junction. They talked to me about rail safety. Uh, but overarching concerns were the environment and how Canada had really lost its way on a very mm -hmm. critical file for both my constituents, but also for the nation. And also about just basic infrastructure, how people were just anxious and stressed about their commuting times, the amount of time they were being stuck in, uh, spending time stuck in traffic, and also about how they didn't appreciate why, how they didn't understand why Stephen Harper wasn't appreciating the detrimental economic impact that was having, right? For a, an ostensible economic manager to not realize how our GDP was being depleted by, by people literally being stuck mm -hmm. in traffic, they found that puzzling and they just wanted infrastructure to be built, particularly in terms of transit, that would actually get people or goods to market faster or people to work faster or people to school faster. So talking about the NDP in the last election, we saw something called Layton mania. You know, in the last weeks of the campaign, Jack Layton's campaign caught on fire, huge crowds, uh, a real sense of momentum, and as a result, they had a huge uh, win, not a government, but they uh, became the official opposition. And, uh, you know, the rest is history as with regard to Mr. Layton, unfortunately. Uh, this year we're seeing with Justin Trudeau a resurrection, I guess, of Trudeau mania too. Mm -hmm. With uh, when did you sense things were kind of changing? The the dynamics were changing. I understand that uh, Mr. Trudeau came into your riding in the last week of the campaign. Mm -hmm. You know, you could analyze it from a couple of ways. I think sort of that the sort of the the, the steam that uh, Justin r brought to the campaign and sort of in what he was doing for the party, you know, dates back to his time when he was first elected as leader. I think we were always confident in it. I think more Canadians need to be exposed to him to understand sort of what he brought to the table. Uh, it was definitely galvanizing. It was definitely tremendous in terms of the momentum. I think e with each and every debate, he got stronger and stronger. The French debates were flawless. Uh, I think, you know, and that actually brought back a lot of nostalgia for me because just mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Trudeau and I know each other uh, from the McGill Debating Union 24 years mm -hmm. ago. And I remember very clearly that his, his aptitude and his skills at, f in d at debating in French were far and above all of the rest of us. There were many Anglophones at mm -hmm. McGill, for example. So I found that kind of comforting and a bit nostalgic. But in terms of sort of like a palpable shift, it was almost around sort of three weeks left, two and a half weeks left. I was spending time in parts of the riding that hitherto had not been sort of strong liberal polling areas. Uh, you know, we had sort of different areas where we knew we would do better than not. But places like Parkdale and the Junction, people were stopping me in the street. They were talking to me about both myself as an individual, but also about uh, Justin Trudeau by name. You know, there were high fives exchanged. People were calling out his name, smiling. Uh, sort of excite that excitement started to sort of mm -hmm. take hold. And I think people th realized that there was a movement afoot for change and that Justin Trudeau could be the harbinger of that change. And it was very, very encouraging. It was great for me. Uh, it was great for my team. It was great for the volunteers because people sense something moving. And I think his visit to the riding in the last week, uh, we were down in Parkdale on, on Queen Street at a, a bar called the Cadillac Lounge, mm -hmm. and it was packed. 
absolutely packed. When I got there, they were still screening people to get in. Yeah. And there were maybe 200 people in line outside just waiting to get in. And that, to me, was a terrific sign of something afoot that people could sort of taste it, so to mm -hmm. speak. Now, you're going off to Ottawa next week for your orientation and uh, waiting to hear when the house will be recalled. What are you going to be your priorities when you're up in Ottawa for your constituents in Parkdale High Park? Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. And it's, um, I've got sort of my pet issues. I've got, I think, issues that are important to the riding. And, so, and when they nicely co uh, coalesce, it's, it's terrific. Uh, there have been people who are talking to me during the campaign and have been talking to me sort of nonstop since about the Syrian refugee crisis. Mm -hmm. And again, you'll recollect I came here as a refugee right. from Uganda in 1972. And I said very candidly to many people at the doors, you know, at a Rogers TV debate, et cetera, that had the previous government, the con previous conservative government been in power in 1972 mm -hmm. when I was in jeopardy in my f with my family in Idi Amin's Uganda, mm -hmm. it's, it's unlikely that we would have arrived if, if that kind of political orientation was in power in 1972. And I'm very thankful for the opportunities that were provided to me and my family and 7,000 other Ugandan Asians here in this country. And I want to make sure that, you know, we pay that forward. And so what that means for me personally, and again, it's also a concern for my riding, is that people want Syrian refugees to be brought to this country as fast as possible. We've made that commitment. I know that there are logistical hurdles we need to cross. We know we need to galvanize forces. We need to coordinate things both with Immigration Canada, potentially with, with uh, you know, military assistance, et cetera. But where there's a will, there's a way. I take mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Trudeau at face value when he said he's committed to that. I'm very committed to it. So that's something that I will actively be trying to work on and promote. But it goes beyond that because it's not just bringing refugees into the country and then sort of leaving them to sort of fend for themselves. It's about, mm -hmm. for example, restoring the IFH, the Interim Federal Health Program, where you get medical care provided to all refugee applicants, mm -hmm. for example. It's about settlement services and ensuring they're adequately funded so we have an ability to house, train, you know, find work for uh, newcomers to the country. So those are some immediate objectives. I also have a, a macro sort of step back objective which deals with my background as a constitutional lawyer and a human rights advocate. I want to see justice uh, and legal and human rights policies corrected. We've been spent nine and a half years sort of in a bit of a never-never land where approaches to law and order have been bigger jails and longer mandatory minimums and a series of sort of setbacks by the Supreme Court of Canada, thankfully, who are acting as the last backstop to protect people's civil liberties and charter rights. I want to be part of a government that's going to lead, uh, be at the forefront of leading in advance uh, and protecting people's charter rights and values and civil liberties going forward and not relying mm -hmm. upon the courts to sort of be that safeguard. We should be leading ourselves. So those are some of the objectives. I've been chatting with newly elected Liberal MP for Parkdale High Park, Arif Virani. Thank you so much for joining today. Thank you. <laughs>